As the nineteenth century drew to a close, so did the Gilded Age, a time of industrial revolution that seemed to secure a bright, golden future for Americans, but this gold was thin and fleeting. Many issues plagued the burgeoning country which spanned the coasts of North America. Something was needed to fuel all these machines, and some power sources were found in lumber, coal, and oil. Many Americans believed that their country had infinite natural resources, and they need not conserve what God had blessed them with. Yet they cleared forests at an alarming rate. They burned through coal and sucked up oil. They invested in mines and steam engines, and the new, newly invented light bulbs and automobiles. The Gilded Age melted in the, into the Progressive Era, a period of a flurry of reforms one of which was the conservation movement. We will explore why people were for excess exploitation and against conservation when the success of industrialism and farming depended on natural resources. Why a country that took such pride in its land would exploit it so wastefully. President Theodore Roosevelt, John Muir, Gifford Pinchot and Francis Newlands were some of the more well-known conservationists, pushing for waste control and resource and pollution regulations. They set up national parks and reserves, which stood in sharp contrast to the smokestack-filled cities. They all must have asked this question again and again, and their words seemed to often fall on deaf ears. In 1909, President Theodore Roosevelt created the National Conservation Committee. In its first report, it stated that America's use of natural resources had three stages. The conquest of the wilderness, then the wasteful exploitation, and then it hoped, starting at that point, the wise and efficient use of natural resources, keeping waste to a minimum. Yet, as was usual of reform attempts during the Progressive Era, the committee's actions were largely ignored. Other groups, such as the Sierra Club, a group formed by John Muir to protect nature, spoke out against some of Roosevelt's decisions, which included approvals of dams like the Hetch Hetchy Project. But why were they mostly ignored? Conservation would be expensive, but would be in the benefit of businesses in the long run. Roosevelt then declared in a letter accompanying the committee's first report that if we allow great industrial organizations to exercise unregulated control of the means of production and the necessities of life, we deprive the Americans of today and of the future of industrial liberty, a right no less precious and vital than political freedom. Rights and liberty were dear to Americans, so why would they allow their rights and liberties to be violated in such a way? Of course, the exploitation of natural resources meant more jobs, more and cheaper goods, more profit for big businesses, and better transportation. There also were so many resources left that perhaps Americans were not inclined to resist. When Jacob Rees released photos of their dirty homes, New reforms to urban life and pollution were suggested. As Gary Nash said in The American People, creating a city beautiful through environmental remedies was one approach to cleaning up dirty cities. Urban planners and landscape architects attempted to counteract pollution and reshape the urban environment by putting in water mains and sewers, planting trees along broadened boulevards, expanding city parks, and erecting monumental public buildings, libraries, museums, theaters, and music halls. But people still wanted industrialization, progress, and capitalism to continue at the same rate without reductions to factory speed. However, as Nash pointed out, they should be worried about their air quality, their food, and their water supply from the excessive pollution resulting from the abuse. This was especially true for the poor people in cities, who were perhaps mostly for conservation. Another obstacle for conservationists was the slaughterhouse, the home of the meatpacking industry made notorious by Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. Up until the mid-19th century, as described by authors such as Charles Dickens, 
common livestock moved about cities with humans mixing in harmony. Industrialization severed this connection, separating human from livestock. Improved transportation meant an increase in the demand for meat. Butchers began to systematically mass slaughter animals. Slaughterhouses used huge amounts of water and disrupted many ecosystems by killing so many animals. Reckless, out-of-control waste and exploitation had lasting, devastating effects on the nation. Harvard geologist Nathaniel Shaney said in the early 1900s that, except for the alluvial plains whereupon the floodwaters laid down the waste of fields of the upper country, nearly all parts of the arable lands which have been long subjected to the plow are thinned so that they retain only a part of their original food-yielding capacity. Moreover, the process of cropping takes away the soluble minerals more rapidly than they are prepared, so that there is a double waste in body and in the chemical materials needed by the food-giving plants. Some farmers employed techniques to try to preserve the fertility of the land, and tried new and more efficient methods of irrigation, such as promoted by the Newlands Reclamation Act but sometimes their efforts backfired, further damaging the land. In its biennial report, the State Conservation Commission of Wisconsin said that we cannot succeed in replenishing our denuded forests, streams, and fields with game and fishes without the application of the very best methods. Yet, perhaps, overall, the worst methods were used. Clearing forests for lumber destroyed ecosystems and habitats, driving countless species to extinction. Clearing was usually done inefficiently. Usually the good trees were chopped and taken while everything else was burned, polluting the air. The logging and floating the logs down the rivers damaged river ecosystems and fish supply. Coal mining caused significant erosion, contaminated the soil and water, and made vast tracts of land infertile. The burning of coal also polluted the air. The collection and refinement of oil polluted the rivers and drinking supply, destroying ecosystems and driving many marine species to extinction as well. The mining and refinement of iron ore for railroads, which required clearing countless acres of forest, also eroded the land. No thought was given to cleaner alternative energy sources because that would have meant spending more money and more time, two valuable commodities in that age. Many Americans were ignorant of these careless methods and their effects until the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. Huge clouds of dust swept across the nation filling people's lungs with dirt and particles and their minds with fear. Over-farming and overconfidence in natural resources were causes of the concurrent Great Depression. Overall, of course, we cannot provide a definitive answer to this question since everyone had different opinions and believed themselves to be right. We cannot change or misconstrue history. We can only analyze it to prevent the same things from happening in the future. Yet it is unfortunate that today there is ever more rampant exploitation of natural resources in the U.S., even with events like Earth Day. Perhaps another time we can come back and make connections between then and now.